Hi, it's Colin Coward. I started the volume to bring you some of the most authentic voices in sports. While you're here, make sure you hit subscribe. Thanks. What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, three and out podcast. Sunday night, about eight o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Not going to lie. I had to delete a couple beers because my heart rate from the weekend couldn't take it. I was too amped up. I needed to relax. It was, that's as good of a weekend as you'll ever see in the history of sports. Like I'm not even trying to overreact here, but that was awesome. You know, as, as someone that's 37 years old now and who've really been working in football or talking about football for well over a decade now, and you become kind of numb to it. And I say it all the time, like, I, I still am a fan of the game. I mean, i diehard Niner fan growing up. But once you're in it, you kind of get numb to it. I, I felt like a 10-year-old all weekend. Well, except for the first half of the Titans game, where I might have took a little nap through. That was uh, that was a little different, I'd say, than the next three games. But we'll dive into that last. I, obviously, you know, the, what we just witnessed... When I say we just witnessed, you know, if you're listening to this on Monday, that, that final Bills-Chiefs game, we'll, we'll dive into that. A couple thoughts on McVay Shanahan, um, LaFleur and Rodgers. That's a pretty devastating loss. Uh, and some thoughts on Joe Burrow. Now listen, th- there are a lot of stuff going on right now. Some rumors, rumors of Tom Brady retiring, Sean Payton I might quit. We'll get into all that probably on Tuesday's podcast. We're going to kind of live in the present and just react to what we just witnessed. And uh, you know me, I'm not going to let anything slide that is is good to talk about. But as of this podcast, three and out feed, subscribe, share it with your friends. You guys know the drill. Leave a review if you could. Middlecoff Mailbag, at John Middlecoff is the Instagram. Leave a question in the DMs, and I will get to that either on Tuesday or Friday. Some of you guys get mad. You're like, you didn't answer my question. Sometimes I just run out of time. If I answer you personally, you re-ask me another question, we'll get to it. We will get to it. But that game we just witnessed, the, uh, let's face it, the AFC Championship game, Kansas City against Buffalo. Let's we'll start with the Chiefs. And I remember, was it a Thursday night game? Uh, Chiefs against the Chargers, where Travis Kelsey had the walk-off touchdown. And listen, I'm... I've been watching football now pretty consistently for that I can vividly remember for 25 years. Since the 94 49ers won the Super Bowl till at present. And I'm pretty confident. And I know, listen, I, I'm not a cowboy hater. I, I Aikman, Emmett, and Michael Irvin, I got, I think those guys, I mean, clearly, they're Hall of Famers. I, Troy Aikman was not as good as Patrick Mahomes. We have never seen a player like Travis Kell, or like, Obviously, like Travis Kelsey, I mean, his statistically, he's going to shatter some records. But like Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is just in a completely different level. Like, he's an unstoppable force in the open field. That trio, especially when you combine them with the head coach, I think it's the greatest offensive trio we've ever seen. And they keep building on this. You're talking about a group now that's going to their fourth straight AFC championship. And they're 2-1 and one in those games. And it took Tom Brady and Bill Belichick beating them in overtime or they would have gone to three state straight Super Bowls. As of recording this, I haven't even seen the line against the Bengals. Breaking news. I'm sure they're heavily favored. Seven, seven and a half, eight. They're, and I know they lost this season, but they're going to be the heavy favorites. Not just to win this game, but to win the Super Bowl. Whoever wins between the Rams and the 49ers if the Chiefs win this game, and I got news for you, they're going to, sorry Bengals fans, they're going to be favored in the Super Bowl. And it's because of those three guys, 15, 10, and 87. Absolute ass-kicking championship winner, all-time great players. Mahomes and those two, I mean, those two combined for like 20 catches, 250 yards, multiple touchdowns, but it's not, the box score doesn't do them justice. It's when they're down. It's when their back's against the wall. They make incredible plays. They make championship-level plays. And all these guys, even Kelsey, who's been who's the oldest of the bunch, who's now on his third big contract, who's made a ton of money, none of that shit matters 
when they're in the arena. Starts with their quarterback, who's just completely under control. It's just awesome to watch. It is. We're watching uh, uh, these three guys offensively with their elite Hall of Fame offensive coach just do spectacular things over and over, year in, year out. It's fun to watch. I felt like a little kid watching that game. Now, a huge part of that was also the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen, who, you know, I, I, he was a polarizing player for a long time. These last two years, like, there is no more debate. He's one of the best players in the NFL. I, I think I said it in the last couple weeks. I, it sucks that I was born in the 80s. Because now, I mean, I don't want to be any older, but if I was born in the 70s, if I was, instead of born in 1984, if I was born in 1974, I would have got to witness and take in 80 sports. And one thing I grew up, because if you grew up in Northern California, my dad, he would have loved the Niner game. I mean, it's just, it kind of made me emotional this morning thinking like my dad would have loved watching the Niners win that game. But like one thing that he always had was talking about Montana, talking about John Elway, talking about Dan Marino. And you just hammer home, like, those guys, how sweet they were. Now, I, you can watch it on YouTube, but it's never the same. If you're listening to this and you're 20 years old, like, you can watch the documentary on Michael Jordan, but it's not the same as watching him. I watched him live, and I'll fucking, to my grave, will go, that's the best basketball player ever. He'll never be surpassed. I feel pretty confident on that. And to my dad's dying days, he thought Joe Montana was better than Tom Brady. And I always argued. Hell, I thought Steve Young was better than Joe Montana. And I'm actually watching this Montana doc. I, I realized where he was coming from. Now, I would take Brady over Montana, but I, I, I've gained a lot of respect for Montana. But you always heard these tales about Elway. This guy that was 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 who was an elite athlete and this special arm. And then there came this kid from Fireball, California. that couldn't hit water from a boat when he was in college. And somehow the Buffalo Bills took him seventh overall. And they've turned this guy, and he deserves a ton of credit too, into a flat-out superstar. That guy, you don't need to be Bill Belichick. You don't need to be Bill Parcells. You don't need to be Andy Reid standing on the opposing sideline. That is box office. Like Mahomes, who was incredible, we know he's box office. He's been box office. The moment he won the MVP, he's one of the greatest players we've ever seen. And he's played like four or five years as a starter. If, his career, if he never played another game, he'd be a lock first ballot Hall of Famer. Well, not everyone just hits the ground running. Some guys take a little time, and Josh did. But you watch Josh tonight. The athleticism, the ability to run, the playmaking, how calm he is. I'd go to war with that fucking guy any day of the week and 10 times on Sunday. That guy is a badass. Total package. And then when you hear... Mitch Morse, the Bills center, who, if you watched the end of that game, was spent extra time. He went up to Andy, went up to Kelsey, went up to Mahomes. He clearly valued his time in Kansas City. And he was asked this week, and I think I mentioned this last week, on like what the similarities in the two players were. And he said that one thing that really stood out, he said a lot of things, right, the physical gifts, but he, but he mentioned one thing. He said they're both really approachable. And we'll get into Aaron Rodgers a little bit later. But I think that's an underrated part about being a star quarterback. Ultimately, you have to be just one of the guys. You make more money, right? Mahomes signed a $450 million contract. Didn't Josh Allen this offseason get $150 million guaranteed? If you just combine their money, you're talking over $600 million. They are so much have so much more money than, every, than the majority of guys on their team combined. It's not even... It's, it's not even like you can't even quantify it. Yet both of the guys, and especially Josh Allen, like Mahomes is just pretty natural at it, just feel like, God, he's just one of the teammates. They are special. And I was thinking about this. When, when I grew up, in my generation, we, we grew up on Troy Aikman, Brett Favre, and Steve Young. That's what I grew up on, the NFL. Fox got it, and it shot out like a rocket ship. And those guys were superstars. And I was a sucker for Steve Young, but I'll admit, Brett Favre was better. And as Marty Morningwig once told me, he thought Brett Favre was the best player he ever saw in those three years. He won three straight MVPs, and it was, it was awesome, right? And it, it created a, my generation to be diehard you know, football fans because of how big and famous and good those guys were. And then the generation a little bit younger than me got Manning and Brady. 
And that rivalry, I remember being in college, like, it was football porn. It was badass. And I started as a Peyton Manning guy. I transitioned to a Tom Brady guy. And now just, I love them both. I, I, I'm glad to have witnessed their careers. And then came the Roethlisbergers and Aaron Rodgers and some of these guys. And every generation has just got these star players. Well, I watched that game tonight, and I felt like a 10-year-old kid. And I, as someone that does this for a living and doesn't want to stop anytime soon, partly because I don't know what else I could do. I don't, I don't have that many skills. Uh, there is going to be a generation of kids that are 8, 9, 10, 11 years old that were at their house today with their father, with their brother, with maybe some of their friends that it hopefully weren't on YouTube that were watching that game and falling in love with the sport of football. Because that a game like that and watching those two guys play makes someone that, let's face it, I, I can become pretty jaded to the whole thing. Yeah, I make money off this. I, I become numb to it. It's moments like that. It's the playoffs where I get to feel like a little kid again, and that's cool. And sometimes I'm jealous. I know all you people listening get to be fans of teams. That's the truth. Like some of the purity left me a long time ago. I felt that watching those two guys play. It's like this is why I love the sport of football. That there is nothing like it. And those two guys, and specifically Josh, like I, we already knew Mahomes was already anointed. For Josh to get to do that in front of, I'm sure the ratings are going to be 45 million people watch that game. Like there is no argument anymore. Josh Allen is a superstar, an absolute, you know, flat out bowler. I feel like I'm, I'm watching John Elway. I also feel like that kind of with Justin Herbert as well. Who are these guys? Where, where do these humans come from? Six foot five that can run like that with that powerful of an arm on the road to do that. It was awesome, man. I mean, I, I, I'm very, very happy. I'm, I'm closer with the people in Kansas City. I'm very, very happy for Kansas City. But I, I'll be honest, like, I, I, I'm a little heartbroken is the wrong word, but I, I do feel for Josh Allen and Sean McDermott. Like, th those guys are, they got something brewing. And I, I think Coach Reed would be the first to tell you that. I mean, he's been doing this for a, 23 years. I, I can't imagine, besides like Belichick and Brady, he's looked down the gun barrel against an opponent and thought, holy shit, these guys are good. And then, you know what's cool about this? And I, I'm a big believer in the just kind of the motto, the cream rises. And sometimes, and I've learned this with age, it takes time. Like some people, like C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young, they're at Oklahoma, or I mean at Alabama and Ohio State. Those guys were clearly elite, 16, 17. They went to Alabama, Ohio State, and they've been elite immediately. There is no guarantee that those guys are going to continue to be elite. Now, I, would, I think they're both really good, but we see it time and time again. Like Tua, coming out of high school, could have gone anywhere. Guy was elite. And we see him in the pros, like he's been passed. Because over time, talent, and when I say the cream rises, like sometimes it takes a little bit of time. And you look at a guy in Josh Allen who went to Wyoming and Patrick Mahomes who went to Texas Tech are the best two young quarterbacks in the NFL. Think about that. Like, to me, that's part of what makes sports really cool. And I think it has a lot of parallels to life. It is not where you start. Now, you have to be talented. You have to work hard. You have to, it, whatever you're doing, it has to mean a lot to you. You have to be very, very invested. But those two guys, now, and again, they, they were, Allen was the seventh pick in the draft. Mahomey was the, I always get him and Watson mixed up. Was he the 10th or 12th? Like, they were both top 12 picks. So it's not like people thought they were scrubs coming out of college. But they did not come from Oklahoma. They did not come from Alabama. They did not play at LSU or USC. Yet, within three or four years, I mean, like I said, Mahomes is going to the Hall of Fame. Josh Allen is starting to put some pelts on the wall to develop a Hall of Fame career. He's definitely a Hall of Fame talent. That much is not even debatable. And you can go to Wyoming, you can go to Texas Tech. And listen, I'm a smaller school guy. And I just, I feel some kinship with some of the small school guys in the NFL because I, I didn't go to, you know, Northwestern or Syracuse or USC. I went to Cal Poly. And when I moved to Philadelphia, when I introduced myself, I told people I went to Cal. Because people wouldn't know what Cal Poly is. So I, I, I take just, I, I get a lot of joy and it excites me when I see these smaller school guys fly up the rankings and pass all these guys from premium schools. Then pass all these guys that have four and five stars. Because 
what you have at 18, 19, 20 years old, as you get older, no one gives a shit. And the one thing the private sector and definitely the NFL, like, if you're good, you're good. And you will separate from the pack. And those two guys, I could watch those two guys play football all day long. Now let's get into the NFC Championship. McVay and Shanahan. And I've been, I was thinking a lot about this because obviously Mike, or Kyle Shanahan's 42 years old and Sean McVay's 35. I think the, in the hiring cycle, you see a lot of different takes out there on television, on the internet. It's like, this guy deserves this job. He's put in the time. I think one of the most overrated things in life is age. I've met a lot of morons that are 30 years old. I've also met a lot of morons who are 66 years old. However old you are, I got news for you, is pretty irrelevant. Because some people are just truly more talented than others. Now, I will never dispute that experience matters, that reps matter. Like when Tiger Woods won his first major at whatever, 20 or 21 years old, it was a really big deal. But as time went on, we looked back and we went, well, he was training like a PGA Tour player from the moment he was like four or five years old. If you've watched the documentary on him, his dad had like a Navy SEAL psychologist mess it, like formulating his mind to be a killer on the golf course when he was seven, eight years old. The guy was on a completely different wavelength than everyone else. Well, when you look at Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan grew up in junior high and high school being the ball boy for the Eddie DeBartolo 49ers. Steve Young, Jerry Rice. Every day in practice, he went. Sean McVay's grandfather was the general manager for the Bill Walsh 49ers. These guys were born into football royalty. Now, just because you're born into something does not mean anything. We have enough evidence. It doesn't mean shit. Because one, I don't know if you're going to like whatever your father or grandfather does. And two, I don't know if you're going to be any good at it. But here's what I know about Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan. Not only do they like football, the family business, they're addicted to it. And two, it's pretty clear in 2022, they're a lead at their job. So they were born into it, massive advantage. Then they loved it, and they turned out to be awesome at it. But here's the thing. Both of them, when they graduated from college, went directly into the National Football League. So when Sean got hired at 32 years old, he had been in the league, been in the NFL for a decade. Experience matters when you like something and you're naturally good at it. You need to build reps. That is important. Part of Bill Belichick, when he got his first head coaching job, you know, in his like early 40s, he had been a coordinator forever at Parcells. He also got involved in the NFL at 1975. Another guy who was born into it. And listen, I'm not saying that these guys are going to be Bill Belichick, but like Bill Belichick, they were born into football families and they fucking loved it. You can't fake that. These guys are football addicts. But the age thing, there are a lot of guys in the NFL, and I've been around some of them, that are over 50, that might be over 60. I wouldn't hire to be, if, if I was in charge, they wouldn't be my position coach, let alone a coordinator. Age is irrelevant. How talented you are matter. And let's face it, in a, a billion-dollar industry, how talented you are really matters. And these guys happen to be way more talented than the majority of their peers. That's not really debatable. Kyle Shanahan has now made a second conference championship with Jimmy fucking Garoppolo. Sean McVay just turned Matt Stafford, and listen, I like Matt Stafford, but let's face it, his resume in Detroit was pretty questionable. Now, we could argue it was Detroit, wasn't him, but then we saw this year, like, well, did he get himself over his head? No, found him, NFC championship. And here's the other thing. They both put all their chips in the table, in the middle of the table, on one trading for Matt Stafford, they spent two first-round picks and a third. And Kyle Shanahan, while he traded for Trey Lance, he kept Jimmy Garoppolo. Because they both desperately, all they cared about was winning in 2021 and making playoff runs in the January of 2022. Well, as Brandon Staley would tell you, he's obsessed with his process. And that sounds great. And NFL Live will probably eat it up, and some of the Twitter elites will be like, oh my God, the process. We're in a results-oriented business. Anyone listening that's in sales, that's in the majority of, orient of industries, if you don't produce, you will be let go. 
we're not, I mean, some of you might be, but if you're not a government employee, you're not on scholarship. Your job will be taken away from you if you don't produce. And there is not a more result-oriented business than the National Football League. You either win or you lose. Well, both of them made bold plays. Trading for Stafford and keeping Jimmy Garoppolo when you traded three first-round picks for Trey Lance, to me, was a bold play. I didn't like it. I said I would have gone from Trey from the jump. Well, guess what? Kyle's smarter than me because it worked. And they're both in the NFC Championship. So kudos to them. They're elite. They're young. They run circles around the majority of the NFL. And it shows you. They have the combination of natural talent, which is elite, experience for younger people. And they, they just, this game, inject this game into my veins. Uh, I, I can't wait. We'll see how the cookie crumbles if I end up in attendance. Though, as someone texts me, they went to the Packer uh, Niner game. And they had really good seats. And this guy DM me, and he's like, I paid $300 a pop. And he was in like the 12th row. I'm like, God damn, I love the Midwest. I, I paid that in seller's fees per ticket for the game I went to in week 18. These tickets for the Ram Niner game are going to be outrageous. I've already seen some numbers on the LA Super Bowl, which I might have been wrong on that. I do think the Super Bowl is going to stay in LA. Uh, that's going to be the most expensive ticket in the history of the NFL. But I, I, I can't wait for this game. I have nothing but respect for both these coaches. They're doing it a little bit different ways. One guy has an elite talent. The other guy has just kind of a placeholder. And they're both just winning games. One guy went, I mean, the Vaughn Miller trade is really working out. Shanahan moved Debo to basically running back. And he's carried the team for a couple months. These guys are certified badasses. So when, when people try to be like, oh, this guy deserves the job. He's 60 years old. I, I don't care how old you are. Are you good enough? You know, with Sean McVay, like he's 31 years old. Do you know what it turns out? Smartest hire the Rams have ever made. Kyle Shanahan, oh, he's just Mike Shanahan's son, nepotism. No, Kyle Shanahan runs circles around whoever you think's a good coach. I'll promise you that. Let's get into the Packers and, uh, and Aaron Rodgers. And I said this last week. I didn't have faith the Niners were going to win. I sprinkled a little money on the money line. Uh, but I actually have a buddy that spent 10, put 10 grand on the money line. That's balls. That's balls. And it, and it worked out. That's an incredible gambling win. But I said that if they lose this game, and even I thought about, I, I couldn't go to bed. I went to bed last night on, on Saturday night at about probably almost 2 o'clock in the morning. It was just, it's one of the just most powerful games I've ever witnessed, gambled on. I'm obviously rooting for the Niners to win that game. But I even up until that punt was blocked, I, I, I was reserved. The Niners were going to lose the game. For as great of a win that was for the 49ers, and it's one of their, in their storied history, one of the most legendary wins in the history of the franchise, you could make the argument that is an even worse loss for the Green Bay Packers, given Aaron Rodgers' contract status, his drama, Devontae Adams is a free agent, just the simmering everything. They were the number one seed. They were hosting. San Francisco had beat them three straight times in the playoffs. They were favored. It was the biggest favorite of the weekend. I watched Matt LaFleur's press conference. I swear to God, it looks like he saw a ghost. And I understand why he looked like that. You don't shake an L like that. That's one that stays with you forever. You lost a game where Jimmy Garoppolo at one point in time felt like he was going to throw for 40 yards. And I think about it all the time. I work in the streaming bit. I'm basically in tech, right? In podcasting, in streaming, and when the Niner game ended, on my other podcast, we went live right away. And it, it's already our biggest stream of all time, and it'll easily be our most listened to podcast. Well, when I was hosting a radio show, I would have had to wait till whenever my show was two days later. I, I would have had, there's nothing I could have done. I just would have had to wait. Yet, the business I'm in, I can immediately grow. It's, it's my greatest advantage that everything I do is real time, if I want it to be. Where forever, just in traditional radio or traditional television, you have to wait for whenever your time slot is. There is no time slot on the internet. I do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. Now, I choose, like, I go out and party on Saturday night or I can work. I looked at Coward. Coward put out a video from the Volumes YouTube channel on the Aaron Rodgers loss. I just checked before I went live. 
It had over 400,000 views. He went into the streaming internet world, started the volume for a reason. It was a huge advantage, the power that he has to go into that business. It's cha- the world is changing, and he's taking advantage of it. He's, that's why, for a guy that has so much success, so much money, I, I'm always just so imp- He's so progressive. He's always just, he's so entrepreneurial when he doesn't even need to be. And that sums it all up. Like, that's why he started the volume. Because that's where the world's going these next 10 years. Well, the Green Bay Packers' greatest advantage is they have, and I still believe this. I know Colin's more down on Rodgers than me. He's one of the greatest quarterbacks I've ever seen. He's one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. He is a master of his craft. But as we saw in Kansas City, and I, I've lived in Kansas City for four months. In 2000, my senior year in college, I interned for the Chiefs in the fall of 07. That place is freezing cold. Yet that game in Kansas City, relative to the game in Lambeau, one game looked like Newport Beach, the other game looked like the frozen tundra. And Aaron Rodgers' greatest skill, being able to throw the ball all over the yard, is completely neutralized in home playoff games. Because it's so cold. You are not going to be able to throw the ball for 350 yards. And it's the same thing with Favre. You are not going to be able to sling the pill when it's negative five degrees. So their greatest advantage is completely neutralized in the most important time of the year. They work all season long. They win all these games. They get the number one seed back-to-back years. Then they play in these freezing cold games. And their best player, their best advantage, can't take over. Now, we could argue he's not aggressive enough. The play calling's not as good. But fact is a fact. I remember years ago when Kaepernick went in there and beat him with the 49ers. A huge reason the Niners won that game is not because Kaepernick was throwing the ball. It's because he was running the ball all over the place. Because it's it, how, Who's catching the ball in negative three degrees? George Kittle, one of the best players in the NFL, dropped a ball that you would see in peewees. George Kittle played at Iowa. He's used to playing in the freezing cold. I don't give a shit where you're from. I can't imagine how difficult it is to catch a ball in that situation. It has to be, I mean, I wouldn't, that's really, really tough. So it shows you the Packers, their success, that place is so cold that when they get in these situations, that's, to me, their best team of the last decade, their greatest advantage is neutralized. And now they're going to a situation where the drama, I texted a couple people this today, is it is easily, I don't even think it's close, going to be the biggest story of the offseason these next two months, off the field, Aaron Rodgers' situation. Is he going to quit? Is he going to retire? Is he going to try to go host Jeopardy? Is he going to demand a trade? Is he going to sign an extension? It's going to be the number one story. He's won multiple MVPs. You win. You have a, a guy that wins multiple MVPs, you're a six-point favored, and you lose to a team where their quarterback is Jimmy Garoppolo. It's an awful loss all the way around. It is a, it's a devastating loss. Aaron Rodgers has lost to the 49ers four times in the last 11 years. Actually, yeah, 11 years. No, 10 years. Because I guess the, it would have been 2012 the Niners beat him. They, they didn't play him Harbaugh's first year. Think about that. There are a lot of memes going around in, in, in my circles of, you know, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers claims, you know, the Niners were always going to pay, and that, that's true. They got four playoff victories out of it. And it's, it's hard to shake, man. It, it, it really is. And we'll we'll dive into more Aaron Rodgers as the weeks goes on, but you know, you just that fucking cold. He he can't they can't dominate in the air. And then the game, you play a team like San Francisco, you're just it's a coin flip game. It was seven nothing in the fourth quarter. Seven nothing. That's that's I guess it might have been seven three in the I guess they might have scored a field goal in the third quarter. So maybe it was seven three. But that's that's a loss that you, you know, I, you could argue it's a worse loss than a great win, and it is a great win for the Niners. That's one of the worst losses in the history of the franchise for the Green Bay Packers. And they're one of the most storied franchises in the history of the world. Let's end on this, Joe Burrow. I say it all the time because I don't think we talk about this enough with quarterbacks. Is an attribute that I, it's a must-have for me. If I, if I was running a team or... I was going to root for a player, be a fan of a player. You have to be tough. And it's the one thing with quarterbacks, like you can kind of 
quantify it with linemen and even linebackers, how hard they hit, or even DBs. Like, you watch Jalen Ramsey, you're like, that fucking guy's tough. That guy will just tackle. With quarterbacks, you know, it's a little harder to tell. Joe Burrow got absolutely destroyed in that game. Well, they have nine sacks. He was getting peppered. He was running for his life. Of course he was. I mean, they have excellent pass rushers on Tennessee, and Burrow's O-line stinks. Yet every single time he was destroyed, he up right back up. He didn't look at the referees and bitch and moan and scream for a call like he's James Harden. He just hops back up, gets back in the huddle. And I've seen now countless interviews with Joe Burrow. The way he carries himself, the way he just talks, I'm like, this guy is an absolute, this guy gets it. And I think that's an underrated characteristic for humans. You know when you're around a guy and you're like, this guy just doesn't get it, man. This guy just won't shut up. We all have like friends, maybe boyfriends of our wives, you know, girlfriends or whatever. Just people that you're around, other men. You're like, I just can't stand this guy. But you're forced into hanging out with them. Could be family, whatever it is. To me, Joe Burrow is the guy like, is Joe coming? Is Joe going to be there? <laughs> like, you know, honey, like I don't really want to go to this party. But you're like, oh, Joe Burrow's going to be there? I'm there. And to me, Joe Burrow, like I said with Mitch Morse, the way he described Mahomes and Josh Allen, their best characteristic is they're just approachable. That's what Joe Burrow feels like. And in a sport where guys make so much money at that position, they become so famous, and ultimately the team, the city, in Burrow's case, like you could argue the state, the Browns are a big deal too, but like, Joe Burrow's going to be the biggest deal in the state of Ohio in terms of quarterbacks. <laughs> that, that ain't a discussion. It feels like he handles himself like a normal human being. I, I, I can't even imagine. I, I can't relate to that at all, right? Most of us can't. The pressure at, in your mid-20s to have that many people. I don't care how much money you're getting paid. That many people relying on you. It's hard. I, I know it's in my 30s. It's like, you know, you start doing a business, maybe you get married, you have a child. Like I see my brother who's had my nephew's, you know, birthday. Pressure is no joke, man. But it's one thing to have pressure of like a wife and a kid or maybe a company of five people or a restaurant where you employ 10 people. It's another thing where you have the entire city looking at you, the entire organization looking at you and handling it just like, oh, it's another Tuesday. It's another Saturday. It's another Wednesday. Like so you're just born with that, man. Maybe you can improve on that over life. But whatever he's got, Urban Meyer chose once upon a time Dwayne Haskins over him. Think about that. Now you can tell me all you want about Dwayne Haskins' great season for Ohio State. I saw Joe Burrow's great season at LSU. Won a natty. 15-0. Will go down as arguably one of the greatest teams we've ever seen. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Like He just got it. That guy just has... He's a special cat, man. And he made a franchise that was, wasn't was just completely irrelevant. It was kind of worthless. Like The NFL didn't only not need it. No one ever had to talk about it. And listen, I'm not trying to talk shit. Like, I, I don't care. Like, I, I enjoy watching Joe Burrow play. But he's, he's not just made them relevant. He's made them watchable. It's one thing just like we talk about you. It's another thing. Like, oh, Joe Burrow's on? What, what channel is Joe Burrow on? Oh, Joe Burrow's playing? Joe, Joe Burrow game's on? 10 a.m. Sunday, week four, I'm going to check Joe Burrow out. How many people are going to want Joe Burrow on their fantasy team? How many little kids are going to buy Joe Burrow jerseys that live in Texas, that live in San Diego, that live in Seattle, Washington? That, that's, that's power. This kid, I thought he was a good prospect. He is a, he's got a chance to be an all-timer, man. I mean, he's, he's pretty special. I know, listen, he beat the Titans and he beat the Raiders, but you're two coming off a, a year when his leg was shattered, he's in the AFC Championship game? Man, that's... What a badass. <laughs> what, what a weekend of football. If you... I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as me because I, I did... I'll be honest. I'll be candid. I, you know, this, I keep it real here on the show. I, I took a little nap uh, during the first half of Tennessee Bengals, but the second half, the Niner-Packer game... This morning's game, and then Bill's Chiefs, that's as much fun as I've had watching football on my couch as I've ever had. <laughs> I, I, I feel that's as good as it gets. That was, 
that was football porn all day, every day, except the first half of the, the Titans game. A little, I was I was tired. I had a long Friday night, uh, and the game was a little boring. But the second half was good. And Ryan Tannehill, you know, let's face it, Ryan Tannehill's who we thought Ryan Tannehill was. Three picks. <laughs> Come on, bro. You can't turn the ball over like that. Podcast be out all week. Uh, we'll have one out on Tuesday. We'll have a golf pod out on Wednesday. Go low. Follow it on uh, the Instagram at Go Low Pod. Uh, Tory Tory Pines this weekend. Can't wait. <laughs> I saw the Masters commercial during the uh, the Bills uh, Chiefs game. That, that got my juices flowing. My 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 heart sputtered. I was like, oh, that makes me that makes me tingly inside. So uh, then another podcast on Friday. Have Stucky for the weekend. We'll just keep rocking and rolling, baby. Let's go. Thanks for watching 3 and Out. You can check out the podcast below in the description. And make sure you subscribe right now to the Volumes YouTube channel.